Well, hello and welcome to today's Sarajevo's CineLink panel. I, this is hosted by the Sarajevo Film Festival, by Documentary Campus and by Screen International. My name is Paula Vaccaro. I'm very, very honored to be able to bring you this curation of talks around CineLink. CineLink Talks is a program of 11 webinars for the festival's 2020 industry strand. And it will be running from, it has started running from August 15th until August the 20th. And it was moved online because of COVID. Um, also, I would like to see, uh, to say that uh, you can check the full schedule and register for any upcoming events at screendaily.com forward slash CineLink Talks with an S. And, uh, and you can hashtag um, the talks or any conversations that go around on social media at hashtag CineLink Talks or SFF Online, which is Sarajevo Film Festival Online. And today um, I am so honored to have this wonderful ladies with me um, <laughs> kickstarting this conversation around distribution. This talk is going to last around an hour and we will leave 20 minutes, approximately 20 minutes for conversations uh, with the audience, for questions from the audience. So please leave your questions um, in the Q&A box that you have on your screen. And my colleague Orlando Parfit, the editor of Screen Magazine, an editor of Screen Magazine, will be gathering them and sending them my way in case uh, there are too many. Uh, but make this talk also yours. Uh, Today's talk is, is about um, new strategies for distribution and, and we call it a bit radical new strategies because sometimes we feel that this panel uh, can bring a conversation around what I want to believe is a call to action. Um, there are current unequal structures that we feel that inhibit access to audiences and there are right deals that don't seem to empower content creators and that there is a need for transparency and that we need a full spectrum of voices and indeed new distribution pathways. And I hope that our panelists um, will bring you some insights sharing their valuable experience around what has worked and what we want to keep close to this practice, but also the hopes and the dreams of a scenario that can serve hopefully um, for plural and original voices much better. Uh, I would like to discuss that about you know, what we want to reject and what we want to rebuild. And if we had the power to do so, what is it and how is it that we will create this radical new ways of distribution? Uh, today, the four people that you're gonna listen to are Ilham, Ilham uh, Shek Herifar, uh, a producer and curator and distributor from the company Hakawati. Uh, Ilham is a a producer with credits, uh, is a BAFTA nominated producer with credits like A Syrian Love Story, Almost Heaven, Even When I Fall, Love and Law, um, Island, and, and the latest film, Ayuni, that I um, highly recommend that you go to Hakawati and you uh, try to screen it from, from their website. Um, Evita Bachnik joining us from Los Angeles. She's a curator and a festival programmer and also a consultant for over two decades. Um, she has participated as project evaluator and panelist in film festivals in all over the world from the US, Europe, Latin America, Israel, China. Um, she has worked for Sundance. She has a, a really big biography that you can also, of course, check in the, in the talks. There is also Karen Chen, who's a producer and a distributor at The Generic Films. Um, Karen has produced more than, than 10 features, but she's also done interactive media and museum installations. Uh, her films include Circumstance and The Exploding Girl and The Motel. She is a president and co-founder and Art and Action, a global production company that specializes in shoots in Europe and Asia, and the founder and president of Degenerate Films, a distributor of independent contemporary Chinese cinema, uh, distributing over 70 narrative and documentary films from mainland China. And uh, then we also have Jamie Dovey, who works at the intersection of documentary film and social justice, uh, organizing for the past decade with a focus on gender and racial uh, justice. Some of the campaigns that she's been working on articulating distribution and social impact include films like Pray the Devil Back to Hell and The Hunting Ground and Knock Down the House uh, featuring US Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So without much ado, uh, I will um, 
give the floor to uh, my wonderful participants in the in this conversation. Um, and I would like to start asking uh, Karen because she um, created uh, something called a distribution advocacy uh, manifesto <laughs> conversation uh, with with Amy um, with Amy Hovey, and they sent that first email early in the year to um, to many of the of the producers uh, and, and and creators in the industry. And it was a, a breath of fresh air. So I, I really wanted to ask you, Karen, uh, how the, the distribution advocacy idea started and, and, and what is it that you embark uh, to do on, 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 that, uh, on that call? Thank you, Paula. And I just wanna thank you for giving us the space to have this conversation. I think that's still pretty rare in the industry. And you know, I, I want to thank my fellow panelists. I really look forward to learning from you. Your work sounds incredible. And I also apologize that I'm zooming in from a car. I had a laptop emergency, so I'm still on my way back from the Apple store. Um, but I'm very, very um, pleased to join. You know, I think both Amy Hobby and I are independent producers in the US. And if you are an independent producer in the US, it's obvious, it doesn't require special skills to know that the distribution system is broken. And the, you know, traditionally in the US and in Hollywood, whoever controls distribution controls the industry. So power is concentrated in the hands of those who hold distribution, right? And, you know, whether that was the studio system or now it's the platforms and, you know, um, what we've seen as a trend in the last few years is also more and more consolidation. And you know, before the pre-pandemic, um, there was an article that I've read where they rounded up a lot of the top um, industry players, and they interviewed six uh, six of the lawyers who are considered power players in Hollywood, and they all predicted the same thing for 2020, which was more consolidation. So I think that this is a trend we are moving towards, as opposed to away from. Um, and it's really concerning because you, we also have on the other, in other parts of the world and including in the US, this trend towards uh, a centralized government control. Whether you see that in China with increasing censorship, whether you see that in Turkey, whether, you know, we're, that is um, a world, a global trend that is happening at the same time as these, you know, corporate consolidations. So where does that leave the independent filmmaker and both Amy and I, I think, have worked um, with distributors, with aggregators. I am a distributor now. You know, as a independent producer, we've also worked with self-distribution or what's been rebranded as creative distribution. And it's not, it's just, the model is just still not working. And there's still too many filmmakers in the U.S. who are not educated enough about what, how distribution works. Because the first question is usually, well, how do I finance my film? You know, when I teach producing classes, it's the, it's the topic that the students want to talk most about. But really, distribution in the end determines fi what gets financed, right? What gets, what gets seen and what makes money determines what will be made tomorrow. So for me, the conversation starts with distribution. Um, and, you know, the idea behind distribution advocates is really came out of conversations that Amy and I had for a year around what can we do, what are other models we could try, you know, what are what is it that um, the independent filmmaker needs, and part of it is this idea of advocacy. You know, I've spent time as a family caregiver, and anybody who's been a caregiver, whether of their parents or you know relatives or a medical caregiver, you know that in the U.S. the medical system is so difficult. It's so overwhelming that they have um, implemented patient uh, advocates at hospitals. And these are people who advocate on behalf of a patient who may not have the knowledge or have the ability to advocate for themselves while they're navigating the system. So the idea behind distribution advocacy is, is based off of that medical advocacy um, model. So that, that was, that's a place to start. And where I, I hope we go is towards data um, transparency uh, towards data, access to data. And beyond that, where we really want to go is towards new models of distribution. And it's something I'd love to talk about later in this panel is that 
our industry, at least on the American side, really promotes an idea of individual ascension, individual success, and even the idea of alternative distribution is named self-distribution. And I think that's a misnomer. I think that's the wrong frame to look at distribution. And the way that the ideas that I've been thinking of uh, going forward come from a collective model, from doing it together, you know, of power in numbers, you know, not just each filmmaker, you know, trying to build the wheel every time they have a film to put out and they want to control the process. I think that there is actually a lot of opportunity in a collective form of distribution for independent makers. Thank you, Karen. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, many of, the, of those who you know, are independent producers like yourself, myself, Ilham as well, uh, will, will res this will resonate a lot, how we finance the films and how we put the films together is so related to how you distribute the films. And, and yet, when we get to the moment of distribution, we are mediated by uh, a market that seems to take away the fruits of our labor of many years and never give back and never create what what we really want to create with our films and and with Jamie um, we talk a lot about this because we are in a in a group about social impact and how films articulate in the distribution moment with social impact um, and we talk about how films also need to um, need to be accountable to the to the communities that that help us make those films as well for example and the distribution models that the market gives us uh, give us sometimes cut a uh, cut across and and, and are become an obstacle for that uh, Jamie how can we um, how can we talk a bit more about this and where we should be going not forgetting from where we come when we make those films yeah that Thank you, Paula, um, it, and thank you for, for inviting me. It's great to, to be here with all of you. I wish we were in Sarajevo together. Uh, I, I love Sarajevo, but uh, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is nice too. Um, so just a little bit of, of yeah, background for those of you who maybe aren't um, you know, familiar with sort of social impact documentary work, um, you know, I, I consider myself an impact, you know, producer, uh, you know, which means that when, uh, you know, when I'm working on a film, it's really uh, with the idea of using the film as a tool for movement building. So um, very often we partner with activists and organizers to integrate documentary film into their work. And um, that work is usually part of a larger sort of campaign for a film that's looking to create social change, whether that's change in public policy and legislation or a change in behavior or attitude. It really depends on the story and on the goals of, of the filmmaker. Um, we very often are doing this kind of social change work for films that have distribution deals that are already in place. Um, and increasingly, um, as Karen talked about with the consolidation um, of, of distribution, increasingly the, those deals are with streaming platforms um, like Netflix or Amazon or, or Hulu. Um, so over the past several years, um, as a community, as we've sort of observed the evolving kind of platform dominance of the streaming networks, a conversation has started in the documentary field um, about how it's increasingly difficult to retain sufficient rights um, or maintain the ability to do social impact work within these, these contracts. Um, very often distributors, you know, they take all the rights with extremely long, you know, term lengths, they have final cut, they own the film, they can you know, red or green light um, impact activities. And, you know, there are positives to the deals in, in, in that very often they come with financing that makes, you know, the, you know, being a documentary filmmaker more sustainable. There's also a wide potential audience that comes with your film being on these platforms. But the, the negative is that the bottom lines are very different, right? So distributors, I don't want to only pick on Netflix, but I will. Um, distributors like Netflix, you know, they're, they're understandably commercial entities. And so their interest is primarily in deepening their subscriber base, not alienating subscribers, 
getting Academy Awards, um, which is good for a film, um, but impact producers who are primarily interested in seeing social change with their film, as, as Paula said, the accountability is different. The accountability is to the subjects of the film, to the individuals and, and movements that the film issues exist in. So there can be misalignment. You know, one of the real challenges is in access, for example. So speaking about the US, um, you know, specifically, there are a lot of assumptions about the accessibility of internet access to Americans. You know, not everyone has access to Netflix and, and high-speed internet. Many schools, prisons, military installations, rural communities, places where you really want to screen a film for your social change campaign, they have firewalls that don't allow Netflix, Hulu, Amazon. Um, and, and this is a big problem. It's becoming, um, you know, there's only a single point of access and a single point of entry when you are, when you're signing these deals. So there's a lot that I can say, giving kind of examples and anecdotes of some of the challenges that we've come across. But what Paula referred to, um, you know, we've been part of a, a working group together. Um, you know, as I mentioned, the community came together and said, you know, what are we going to do about this? This is like, you know, the transformation of the media business. It's taking place now, I mean, since COVID overnight, every distributor has become a streamer. Um, you know, new norms and deals are going to be codified now. So this is a crucial issue to tackle. So what we're doing is launching a pretty comprehensive research initiative to get data um, in order to evaluate really the specific nature of the challenge. Um, and and solutions and ways forward. So how do we talk about this publicly at the level of deal making? What are the very tactical things that we can ask for in contracts with streamers that can protect the social impact work that we want to do? And I can talk a little bit later about how we're setting up that research, some of the questions that we're asking, um, and also what we hope to to get out of that. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, and and, and on that note, uh, when it comes to the deal making, uh, I wanted to um, open up the, the, the floor also to Ilham because as a producer, um, she has decided to also create a distributor, uh, a distribution company within her company. And I think, uh, I suspect that there is also that frustration that producers sometimes have. And, and so she is an educated producer that decided to go forward and actually operate in that space. Um, and I wanted to ask you, Ilham, a bit about your, um, your, not only your hopes and dreams for the future, but also what prompted you to, uh, to get into that space and how was your, your journey to, to get there? Yeah, thank you. And thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. Um, I kind of, I started distributing basically because I didn't really have a choice um, in a sense. I had, as an independent documentary producer, I think often when you start making a film, nobody really sees what the film is going to be. And that's probably the best thing for the film as well. That's actually how real creativity can actually take shape. And it means that very often I, I don't attach distribution to my films at a very early stage. And it, it allow, allows a kind of, a freedom or a sense of creativity to take shape. And so I started to realize that the distribution of the film was an extension of its storytelling and that as a producer, often I had a responsibility both to subjects, um, to empower, to protect, to center um, certain questions, individuals, people um, that perhaps wouldn't be um, protected in the same way if I handed that over. Um, but as I said, the first film that this happened with was a film called A Syrian Love Story by Sean McAllister. And when we first finished the film, it kind of fell in this moment uh, where it's a film about a family from Syria who become refugees. It's shot over five years. And when the film was first finished in 2015, it wasn't, um, you know, people were saying to us, oh, Syria's already happened. You know, we've had all the Syria films and I just, you know, this is an area that I'd worked for a long time. I'd worked in community spaces with refugees for about 10 years before working in film. And I hadn't seen anything depict this narrative. And so 
to me it was it was just necessary for it to be visible so what we did is we coordinated a kind of we basically brokered an agreement between our broadcaster the bbc and our main financier the bfi and set something up that i suppose maybe a distributor wouldn't have been able to do because we essentially kind of broke all the windows broke all the rules and we also broke everyone's expectations because we would then we had this kind of insane visibility and two million people in the uk saw the film within the first month that it was out so it was a really dynamic um completely overwhelming month of work that really made me realize the power in in kind of owning all the aspects of of that storytelling and it's something that would have been lost if we'd given the film to a distributor and and so i think that gave me this insight and it's not my ideal to always distribute the films that i produce but certainly it's enabled me to do certain things that are completely um unconventional and you know there are films that we've essentially more or less given out for free because it was you know we made it that our next film with sean was about uh in work poverty in the uk and this is not a subject that you can actually be charging people 15 pounds at the cinema to see it's a subject about um it's about poverty in the uk it's about class it's about things that you need to think who's seeing and who's kind of enabled to have those conversations but i mean i don't want to digress too much into um examples i'm sure everyone's got many examples but i think for me my hope and dream is really that i'm not always the distributor of the films that i'm producing really i'd much prefer i mean i'd love to have an advocate in in the sense of what um karen was talking about but i think there is really something that we need to build in terms of allyship and community in independent spaces and there's this other notion that i kind of feel is maybe almost a provocation to what we are also talking about which is this kind of you know the space where there is so much consolidation and everything is for commercial gain and i mean the day that we're all watching the same film will be a really sad day for creativity and i don't want to see that day so how does that you know that notion exists in the sense where you're understood in these kind of really skewed versions of success or um you know i and and also kind of not forgetting that i think you know films could be extremely successful if they had a uh, certain marketing for example you know i i really i i think i don't know whether it's an accurate measure to kind of talk about for it, for instance that even the box office in a sense because there's such different things at play and you know if you have 1 million in marketing costs to spend then great you get 1 million entries and the, it, it's an equivalence I say this is an independent documentary producer I 100% believe that if I had 1 million to promote Ayuni then 1 million people will see it absolutely and so yeah it, to me that is kind of the provocation in the space as well which is I actually don't think everyone should be watching the same film this is really really scary it speaks to what Karen again was talking about government control and as soon as everyone speaking from the same page then that actually isn't harmony that's kind of dictatorship you know it's like not what we should be aiming for so those are a couple of thoughts from me and maybe just to add one thing in terms of accessibility as you were mentioning Jamie i think this move to the virtual space also highlights something that isn't talked about enough in the space of distribution which is disability accessibility so you know questions of how do you make films that you're making accessible to audiences that essentially haven't been conceptualized by the traditional models and we have many things um you know there are many um schemes or or various different things that are trying to enable a broader view or some sort of understanding i suppose um you know closed captioning or signing is becoming like a more um prevalent thing in panels um but at the same time it's not it doesn't exist all the time it's it's not here for example and i wonder about you know where is everyone's responsibility to shift that you know should i have asked that question um would that have changed something um and you know th this kind of 
understanding also of audience is still really skewed and really small. And, um, and yeah, I just wanted to make that note. Thank you, Ilham. It's uh, so, yeah, it opens up this, this idea of provocation. And, and while you were talking, I was thinking about Ebe, who is, is in LA. And of course, some of the, some of the things that you're, right, that you're bringing up and, and putting to the table, like full front, um, are real provocations for the way um, the, for the way Hollywood uh, sees the, the business of film, right? And how we should be measuring success. And a lot of times when we talk about um, distribution or the misnomer, misnomer of self-distribution, um, we uh, hear, oh, you can do that with documentaries, but of course you cannot do that with narratives because narratives are bigger and narratives need more money and it's not enough and how you can make it enough. And yet both the narrative and documentaries, independent filmmakers, uh, we many times see how all the revenue of our film gets, uh, I'm not gonna say lost, but gets uh, placed in, in between the filmmakers and the creators and actually the many middle people that are a part of the, of the film system, let's say. Um, so I wanted to ask you, Ebe, on the one side, how does this, what, what Ilham and, and Karin and Jamie have said so far resonate with you and with your daily um, interactions, like with more, more close to, to the Hollywood? Uh, okay, thank you, Paula and uh, everybody, Jamie and Elham and <coughs> Karim. Um, I, I, everything that everybody said is just right on point. What, you know, it's very little what I can add. Um, I'm going to say that um, in a way, and I love the word advocate, ad advocate and I, you know, I absolutely believe in that and I felt that since I moved uh, from Argentina 21 years ago, I became a little bit of that. Uh, even in, in, a, in a pro bono, even, you know, even if I was working with different organizations, uh, which I did for many years in different, you know, for different festivals, um, it, you know, it, it just was like a natural um, sort of progression of my work as a, as a programmer or as a film lover that I actually had to, you know, put on my shoulders many times, you know, the actual, you know, sort of promoting not only a film, but, you know, the filmmakers, et cetera. I'm, I'm going to go a little bit, you know, back to some of the stuff that was said, because as, um, some of the things, you know, we are discussing collectively, you know, and, and this is really global, but, you know, I, I'm more familiar with for example, the way um, uh, films are produced in Ibero-America. And I've been thinking about certain things that pertain to, and like the, I think, uh, um, Karim or, you know, even you, Paula, said, is the accountability of, you know, how films are made, where the money comes from. A lot of the money that is being used to produce films, especially in Ibero-America, comes from public funds. It's the same funds that, you know, different, you know, way of uh, uh, maybe the, the specific source. Uh, but it's the same, in a way, for me, fans that go to schools or hospitals or roads. And I feel like, you know, we need to start rethinking how, why, why are we making the films? For who? How much they cost? Who is really paying for those? And the accountability for me, it's, you know, especially today in, in this time of age, we, we cannot think, you know, like lightly. And, and I know all of you, and especially in the case of uh, El Human Caring, who produced, you know, really um, amazing uh, content that goes to social change, et cetera. But I, you know, I'm talking more broadly um, and I've been seen and, and I felt like we were a little bit of a party um, in the world of filmmaking, you know, films were made and everybody was, you know, very happy and, you know, everybody was kind of getting into this, you know, market of films. And I was like, wait a minute, what, what are we doing with this? Where, where are we going to do it? How are we not thinking the same way in terms of not just distribution, of, but how we actually get 
those films in front of the people with all these uh, barriers that we know that exist, like accessibility, like, you know, now we, we see the discrepancy or the disparity between the people who actually have access to internet or not, etc. cetera. Um, and to me, accountability and sustainability were like something that I kept thinking. And now I feel like if we do not start addressing that and we just, you know, and, and definitely, and I believe it was Karen that said, we have to start thinking of the distribution, but not just the distribution is why are, why are we putting this money that could, you know, feed people or build hospitals? Why am I doing this film? We need to be really more socially responsible of the content we're uh, producing. And I felt like there's been a little bit of, you know, like, like I said, like, you know, a happy feeling of all this. Um, and, 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 and in, in, in talking about that, the other part of, to me of the equation, and maybe because I come from festivals and I see, you know, this, I, I always call this triangle, you know, festivals, we are like these, um, you know, bridge between the filmmakers, you know, the, 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 the creators and the filmmakers and, and the audience. And I feel we need to involve the audience differently. I think if there is something that we should learn about this pandemic, uh, you know, world we live in, is that we actually need to involve audiences in a completely different way. I know we've been doing that, kind of asking for money, you know, like crowdfunding, you know, using their social media. But still, there is this notion that, oh, you know, and I'm going to say this lightly, and maybe Paula understands this. I have to find my friends who, you know, from Latin America and that, you know, love to have, you know, free content. And I'm like, that's wrong. That's wrong. But that's not wrong just because they want something for free. It's just there is a different involvement if you understand, you know, what are you, you know, doing and why, you know, like, I, I don't know if communities know really what are they paying for. What I'm trying to say is that this new model that we are all thinking about needs to have the audiences in a different way. And if we're thinking about you know, shelters, prisons, schools, um, you know, nursing. I mean, we need to think the, the way we distribute, not just in the regular, okay, this is going to television, to a platform. We need to start thinking everything differently. We need to open our minds and create pathways for the audience to actually be invested in something that we're making, whether we're doing, of course, if it's your money and you do whatever you want, but if even, even though, even so, in this time of age, I think we all need to have a completely different social responsibility of what we're doing. I don't know if this answers the, you know, your question, Paula, but I feel really strongly about this because I've been seeing as a programmer, especially, and now as a, a you know, getting more into uh, producing, and I just have, I'm going to have a film premiering at Outfest in, in like a week or so. Um, I, you know, I, it, it, it sort of hurts me to see all this content. And I'm talking about thousands of films that do not see the light of day. And I think in terms of the amount of money that was invested in those projects, amount of effort, years, et cetera, et cetera. And again, collectively, we've been thinking about how to make films, how to make them better, how to, you know, uh, streamline a lot of the things. But we collectively haven't thought so much and how we, we haven't really dedicated and brainstormed as much in terms of what to do with all that wealth that we're creating, you know. And, and I think if we don't do that, it, this is like, you know, the hand and the egg. We're just going around and around and around. And, you know, there are going to be some initiatives here and there, but we're not going straight into the, you know, it's like, okay, you know, poverty or, or hunger, you know, like let's give a little bit of food here and there. No, you need to go and look at the, you know, the reasons, the causes for that. And I feel with cinema, we've been a little bit blind on, you know, we just want 
to our films to be distributed. And I love the fact that we're talking, you know, in, in the case of, of um, an Elhum or, or Karen thinking about, you know, this collective idea of distribution. But I think we need to, to involve the whole community. We need to change the way we think cinema as a, something like, you know, personal more into, okay, this is, this is the hospital of the community. This is the road, this is the school. Because if we just think of the films as something that, you know, it's my house, you know, uh, and I have a fence and, you know, I, I make it really pretty, that doesn't work. I, I feel that that model eventually is going to collapse. Thank you, Eve. I, I think what, what you're mentioning, because especially you were mentioning Latin America and, and some years ago, five or six, or four or five years ago, I remember doing a presentation about our, the combining Argentina and the UK and their film production. Um, and everybody was in awe that Argentina and the UK had produced the same amount of films that year. So Argentina that year had produced 199 films and the UK had produced 200 films um, with a complete different, um, you know, the gross, box, the, the gross box office that year for the UK was 1.6 billion and for Argentina was 266, 7 million. So the, the disparity in terms of the production and the distribution and the revenue was, was enormous. Um, and, and, and of course, from the filmmaker's view, it was, uh, it was pretty, pretty different. Um, Karen, I wanted to go back to some of the things that we were discussing, and I'm sorry I, I fell off the, the cliff. I always say, if, if you don't fall out, it's not Zoom. Um, and and I, I, I guess, Eva, you, you, you really took it. Um, my, my conversation was around uh, this idea that people say, oh, you can self-distribute if you have a dog, but if you have a narrative, you can't really do that because there is so much money involved, much more money involved. And, and how can we bridge those things? And, and Karen, one of the things you were saying, you know, how can we do this? Where um, Ilham said something about I don't want to give my film to a distributor and my film will get lost. I mean, the fact that we have embedded in the idea of those who have to get our films to audiences as the possibility of losing our film tells us the gigantic divide there is between what is their actual role and what is the role that we all know, all meaning independent producers mainly, um, that has that comes back to bite us. You know, every time we finish a film and we get to distribution, instead of being that moment of joy of encounters with the audiences where we know we can actually thrive. And, and, and I'm a bit big um, defender of the producer's role that never finishes when the film is finished, of course, it's actually halfway when we finish a film. We, we have another halfway to go to actually accompany our films during distribution and doing so many things, whether it's social impact or, or not. So I, I wanted to touch some of those things, Karen, with you on, on the ideas and, and how can we um, make sure that this, this collaboration, this advocacy, um, this collective brain, uh, manifests and actions because you know both both spaces right you know the documentary space and you know the narrative space a bit like like myself so so how how do you see that that working how do you see that operating oh i mean these are great questions you know i'm gonna try and not take up too much time because i know there are a lot of questions but you know just to answer in relation to some of what's been said you know jamie said something about who actually has access to the internet. And there's a, there's a quote that I say a lot from my friend Gary Chow, success is a function of your access to networks. Success is a function of your access to networks. So whether that's something as simple as the internet network, or if it's, you know, in the US, um, the distribution system works for a very elite few, the people who have access to, you know, the sales agents or to the, to the buyers, to the distributors you know, that they can get their film into Neon or A24. And Ilham said something that, a, a few things that I really agree with. And one is that when I tried to explain what distribution is, the best way to say it is distribution is marketing. It really is. I mean, it's, it's essentially what the work is. 
and it depends a lot about how much money you can put behind the marketing, how much effort, how much labor. And I think that's something, Paula, you're pointing to is the producers sometimes get lost in that process, you know, of marketing, marketing the film once it's been acquired. But the power and the, and the resources behind the marketing that determines what gets seen, who gets to see it, and then what gets financed. Um, and also about film festivals, you know, film festivals, I think, have become such a crucial point of conversation because now we are in a world without many of them. And film festivals are almost like the first, they're that first toll gate on the bridge, right? I almost think of that bridge as a private highway to distributors and who gets to go on that private highway? Very few people, very few films, you know? So I, there's, there's a lot that's working, there's a lot um, in terms of the infrastructure that's working against the independent filmmaker. You know, so how do we combat that? You know, one, you start with education. What are the rights that you can fight for? What are the delivery expenses that you can negotiate out of? You know, just very simple um, education points that a producer, you know, that has done 10 films or 20 films knows. We just know it because we made those mistakes of not knowing it before. So educating, this, educating filmmakers, especially from communities like my own, whether it's Asian American or immigrant communities or indigenous, that that doesn't have that community history of knowing how to negotiate for the, for those rights. Um, you know, the other thing that I really want to start pushing towards and thinking more about is a collective model. I've done the self distribution because I've started producing Asian American films. You know, I distributed two of our own films that we produced. That's how I learned how distribution works. That gave me the knowledge to start a distribution company for uncensored independent Chinese films right, the films that are not allowed to be distributed in their home country, I'm able to bring them to the states and send back revenue for the filmmakers. But what, what's the next level? Like, what can we do where every filmmaker doesn't just have to embark, embark on a year long journey to get their film out to audiences, right? Like, regardless of where the filmmaker comes from in the world, what I have found is every filmmaker has the same universal desire, and that is a desire for audience. So how do, how, do we, um, how do we work together to make that happen as opposed to working against each other, as opposed to like trying to get that one slot on the streaming platform? I want to be that documentary on that platform, right? So how do we work together? And I thought, well, what if, you know, immigrant communities like the Korean American community, they, um, when they couldn't get loans from banks, they would meet every week and each person would bring, let's say, $100. And if there were 20 people, then each um, family each week would get to take home the entire pot. And that was the loan or the money that they would get to, to pay for whatever it is that they needed, you know, the, the capital for. So what if 100 or 500 independent filmmakers got together and we each put in $1,000 into the pot? Well, that would fund a, a couple or a few years of a distribution company owned owned by independent filmmakers, where we could hire a staff, a marketing staff, essentially, a booker, a publicist, marketing team, to put our films out there, the, you know, the 100 or 500 filmmakers who put the money into the pot, right? So there are just things like this that I'm thinking of, of how we can work together, because we're at a point where we cannot just individually confront the consolidation and the fascism that's coming out of, out of, you know, big national governments. This is so exciting. It really is very exciting to think like that for me. Um, I would like to take some questions from, from the audience, if that's okay with you. Um, we have a few questions here. Um, and one of them, it says, uh, there is a question in relation to the impossibility of collective IP and distribution. Uh, it has been a few times during the past few years that I have worked with creatives who wish to share their distribution rights with everyone involved in the film, and that has been proven structurally impossible in our location, at least in Finland. Can you share any stories of or knowledge on this topic? Um, Danai Agnosto from Finland, I would imagine. Um, who would like to say something, some, um, Ilham? 
I mean, I can just make a comment, maybe not as much directly in response to the question, but I think every time that feels like there's a hurdle in relation to the existing structure, I think it's really important to ensure that the things that you do are not exceptions to the rule, but they, they become precedents because mm. basically we're in, we, I feel like we exist in spaces where nothing's, you know, that there are ways that things work, you know, there's the highway that you take, but nobody's ever, well, we don't hear as much about those who go off the beaten track. We don't get the nuts and bolts. They don't have the same visibility. And so I think it's really in your, these things happen all the time. It's, it's, the, it's just that they're much more grassroots. They're a lot less visible. And I think it's really within our responsibility within this creative industry to ensure that things that are countering the mainstream dominant narrative or way that things work become precedents. So, you know, when I did something unusual with the distribution of the Syrian love story, I ensured that there was a case study and little by little that became much more, it became much more normalized for something like that to happen for documentaries. And now it's just like many documentaries do that. So it's not quite a, an answer, but it's a way of saying, I don't really believe necessarily always in structures. I think structures exist also for their own um, existence, I guess. And much of what we've all discussed is about what the filmmakers can do. And I'm quite interested to also know what institutions can do. And we talk so much about challenging and changing, but we're the people on the ground who are constantly making changes. And I hear so little about what's happening in places of power to change. And you know, if you make, you, you make films with intention, you know, this notion of what every filmmaker wants is to meet an audience. It's one way of saying that every filmmaker is trying to have a conversation. They're trying to figure something out. They're trying to share that. And so it's really, um, it's really amazing that we've come to a point where our films are reduced into these kind of very narrow-minded frames of operation and everything comes down to only an economic value which is really skewed um, because the social return on investment in a certain film might be much greater it might be you know life-changing to huge portions of the population but have very little economic value sorry i've gone off on a slight tangent but just to say um intention i think is something that when you're making a film you respect that side of things you respect who you're making a film with and i really think that that intention needs to kind of um, rise, mm -hmm. basically. Um, yeah. The intention within structures needs to be to actually enable, um, whether it's creativity and trying to answer a question, empower people to actually ask those questions they're trying to ask within their films, whether in documentary fiction or anything in between. And, and that will cause the structures also to change. Yeah, and, and to piggyback off of that, um, the research that I referenced which is being led by the Center for Media and Social Impact at American University. Um, you know, in addition to interviewing, you know, filmmakers and impact producers about, um, you know, their experiences in navigating contracts and 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 social impact work with distributors. We are also, um, you know, talking with entertainment attorneys. We're talking with distribution companies. We're talking. Um, you know, with folks who can um, also share uh, excerpt, you know, excerpted language and contracts so we can understand how, um, you know, some folks have successfully, uh, you know, navigated uh, this issue outside of the sort of, you know, um, norms that we, we see. Um, you know, there are filmmakers, uh, you know, who certainly, you know, they've been able to, for example, uh, you know, insert certain rights into into contracts with streamers because they had leverage in different different ways. There were things that the streamers kind of wanted from the filmmaker, and so the 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 producers at the beginning were able to say, okay, well, we want to be able to send DVDs to any screening locations we want, which is very often impossible. Uh, you know, when when you're when you're uh, assigning your rights. Kind of a way to uh, you know to streamers, and so our hope is to really you know have this systematic 
intelligence and data gathering process. So, um, you know, we we are capturing those those stories of, of folks who have been successful working outside of the you know the the structures as you you know as you said at home. I, I'm gonna just thank you say two, two things and and going back to what they were saying and 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 again because I I come mostly now from the festival side and it's true that you know we are kind of we are gatekeepers uh, and we also have a responsibility and one of the things that I like and I belong to you know the uh, people of color uh, collective uh, and we're trying to also change this um, you know the the color of the gatekeepers because that's been also the problem and I one of the things that I you know been fighting all my life you know coming from for example from latin america is you know how you you know in a situation where you have a little bit more power not not much more but how can you actually bring a different narrative and um sometimes this struggle and i'm i'm going to say bluntly one of the main issues i you know living here in the states has been always you know not just the content but oh it has subtitles and so you get into all this new world where you have a lot of content that a lot of people just don't want to even see because, you know, it has this uh, subtitle thing. So it's even if you have the money to promote the film, you face this thing, you know, with the audiences. And again, you know, when, you know, we, ha we, we have to, you know, I keep seeing, thinking, and all these ideas that you're mentioning, I think they're brilliant. And we have to go one by one and every one of them has to be implemented and make sure that, you know, I love the word dialogue because I believe, you know, exactly that's what, you know, filmmakers want. But we're, you know, again, we're forgetting the, the person we're talking to and we're forgetting where he's watching the films, why he's watching the film, um, when, you know, whether he's tired or not, or what kind of, you know, I, I read one of the questions that somebody posed there, people maybe not, doesn't have the time to watch, even during COVID time, the, a whole film, you know, do they want to see shorter, you know, uh, content, um, you know, different way of, of accessing them. Um, and I'm going to just briefly bring an experience in talking about Sorry. this. Eve, I, I yes. don't want to interrupt you. I just want to make sure that some of the questions that we have, because we have seven minutes, I want to yeah. try and see if we can tackle some of the questions because you are touching on them. One of the questions, for example, is if we think that in the digital age, especially in times of isolation, short films will increase. Uh, so you were you were about to say something about your short films. So so maybe it was that. And then also there are two questions around festivals and distribution. One is about um, if festivals, film festivals, are, are fitting in more in the for the year round distribution from Wendy Mitchell, and uh, and another person saying you know what will happen um, with distribution strategies if. Uh, COVID takes control of 2021. So I want to see if we can touch those those questions uh, so nobody leaves the room and dissatisfied after this hour that is about to be finished. So so I just wanted to make sure that we, we bring them uh, forward. So I'm going to just say quickly, I believe we should think in terms of, you know, the length. And I believe probably, you know, shorter content will fit better, you know, the needs of some people. Two, I think festivals are now in, you know, definitely taking a role in, you know, online distribution, even if it's not really called that. But, uh, you know, most of the festivals, like in the case of, for example, Seattle or, or uh, Minneapolis, where I'm, you know, been involved with, they directly, you know, keep on promoting films through their channels, uh, taking really little um, income, but making sure that the their audience is, you know, are, are still, you know, getting the content. So, you know, eventually becoming sort of um, uh, distributors online. Um, and, and I'm just going to finish with um, this idea. Uh, last year, I was able to participate in a, um, a meeting in uh, Asuncion del Paraguay, where they have uh, creative industries all together. And I'm just going to throw that in there because the other thing that I believe we should do is get together more with other creative industries, 
collectively and globally because there's a lot of knowledge that we you know can share and a lot of stuff that we can do together that we're missing because sometimes the film industry is just by itself and then many other you know creative industries you know you name it music and and art and culinary and etc cetera, etc cetera, uh, fashion uh, the other side but um you know that's that was my, in a nutshell what i wanted to say Thank you. And absolutely, I agree. In the UK, we have the Creative Industries Federation, and I always think that is such an enriching uh, moment when I when I get together with uh, with others that are not from cinema. So that's a really great point as well. Um, and 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 we are left with this question of what what will be the distribution strategy of the distributors if COVID-19 takes control of 2021 as well? Because it says we, we know that most of the distributors don't prefer online screenings. Um, Karen, do you, have a, do you have anything for this question from the audience? I mean, it's a really good question. I will say on the collectivity front, you know, there's two films I'm producing that are, we're modeling a collective ownership and there's, Honestly, the only thing to do as a producer is you hire a lawyer who's willing to be open and you try to make a new model. You know, it's up to us to create that model. Um, you know, Wendy Mitchell asked a really good question because with, I mean, this all ties into the idea of audience. It, you know, we don't pay enough attention to the audience in independent films, 100%. And, you know, I work with a film festival. They are 100% audience driven. It's a small festival in Northern California their festivals next week. So they are providing drive-in screenings and virtual screenings. It took a lot of work to create the drive-in screening, but they're dedicated to their audience. So it makes total sense to provide the best way for their audience to experience the film. And I think that this is what is happening on a really large unprecedented level with uh, film festivals and distributors. They, you know, we all have no choice but to experiment. There's this large scale experimentation happening. And I'm really curious to see what's working and what's not, you know, like Carlovi Berry took their festival on the road to how many cities was it? I mean, I found that really interesting. Um, distributors have all had to move online. And again, those with the marketing muscle are maybe doing better than those without. But it's, you know, we cannot just move online because it's, it's the easiest thing for us to do. We have to meet the audience where they are. We have to, and that takes continual work. But at the end, it's like the, um, the more audience driven we are, the more successful we will be. Thank you. I want to give the, the word to Jamie and then to Ilham, who uh, both w wanted to, to chip in, I know. Yeah. So yeah. Jamie, please. I'll, I'll try to be really, really fast. I mean, I think that this is a moment for distributors to really meaningfully diversify the acquisition of content and, and work with content creators, like going beyond the six or seven signature festivals and looking to regional festivals, looking at festivals like like Black Star in, in, in the US that are moving online. You know, stories, as we all know, stories shape the world as much as the world shapes stories. And so the perspectives and viewpoints that, you know, we're, we're getting, the limited, you know, viewpoints, um, they're hugely shaping our understanding of of the world and, and it's a moment for distributors to really like bake equity and inclusion into their practices, not as a nice to have, but as core to the integrity of, of their work. And I think that, you know, this move online potentially, I think can, um, you know, can aid in that. I also just wanted to quickly say about short content that, you know, shorter, shorter content is always so useful for impact campaigns. We all the time have advocacy groups who are asking for 10 minute clips, five minute clips that they can integrate into their work. Again, this goes back to audience goals, what you wanna see with your film. These, this type of shorter content very often isn't shareable via streaming services. And you, know, you have dashboards, online dashboards, where maybe you get streaming numbers by country, but you're not getting any other data. So you can't engage and follow up with audience you know, members to share that short content with them. And so these are all the things that we're trying to sort of, um, you know, tackle with, with the research. And I encourage you to, you know, follow the Center for Media and Social Impact so you can, um, you know, read the outputs that come out of that, that initiative. Thank you, Jamie. Ilham, um, Yeah, I please. just wanted to, to make Close a, the floor. 
well, okay. Um, I suppose maybe it's kind of ending with another kind of provocation in a sense, because I think we talk always about what the audience wants, but I think to some extent, maybe the audience doesn't always know what it wants. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying that in the sense that for me, discovering things through film was what brought me to filmmaking. And I think the potential to learn and to not know what you're going to get is one of the greatest joys that a film can bring you. And this is also one of the risks of the space that we're in, in this kind of, you know, it's highly marketed, everything contrived and like driving through stereotype and, you know, consolidated everything. And so just kind of displacing this notion of what, it, you know, well, whilst we're thinking how distributors should adapt, uh, adapt, how festivals should adapt, well, you know, maybe a festival is more of a curatorial space than it is a launch pad in, in the future. And it becomes a space of discovery. Um, maybe, you know, audiences will trust more to simply tune into something and learn something new and be taken completely out of their comfort zone. And just a final point on subtitles. I know this is, I mean, I've only produced, I, I mean, anyhow, by virtue of my background, by virtue of my interests, I tend to only watch films either with subtitles or intentionally films by black, indigenous, people of color, by women. And so to me, this notion of kind of the intention of what you're tuning into and kind of why you're seeking something out is really key. And I feel that as storytellers, we can also disrupt the way that those things are talked about as well. So, you know, we talk about subtitles as like the big thing, like the turn off. I think we need to find a new narrative of how we talk about it, you know, make it into the magical ingredient. The last, you know, um, Oscar winner was a subtitled film. And, and rather than, you know, maybe this is the new secret ingredient. Can we turn this around? Because to me, the space that we're in at the moment, you know, the, the world leaders that we have the world over are inward thinking. Everyone is kind of, you know, centering into their islands. The only way we can really combat any of these things is through storytelling, creativity. And we have something huge in our hands as filmmakers and, and subtitles is wonderful. It's your way into another world that you wouldn't be able to get if you, sp if you, if you don't speak that language. So, I, you know, can we disrupt some of these notions that have held us back um, and rethink in a much bigger way? Uh, that would be my, that, that was the, the final kind of point that I wanted to make. And it's an extremely valid point and I appreciate um, all of you with your very thoughtful answers and your knowledge and sharing um, with, with me and with all the audience. We had so many, we have many other questions and I'm sorry we, we ran out of time. Um, but I am extremely grateful for, for you. And I think these days um, where we as independent uh, producers many times are battling the idea of putting together the word IP, which generally is used to talk about you, intellectual, intellectual property, uh, to make it an equivalent of independent producing so we don't lose that IP, so we can actually gather our films and, and create this collective experiences of distribution could be a very important thing to keep in mind. I would love that uh, one day we can turn that IP uh, from in intellectual property to independent producing and they become synonyms as well. Well, um, thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I want to say thank you, of course, to the Sarajevo Film Festival for allowing me to um, not only moderate the the, the talks that I've designed, but also for giving me so much freedom to design these talks. I've, I've gathered some of the brightest and most brilliant friends and, and allies and beautiful people that I know out there. I really push for all of you to be here. You're all here. We have some uh, great, more, more great people to come. Uh, I invite you all to join the next talks. Um, the next talk that I, that I uh, am going to moderate is tomorrow about platforms and TVs. Uh, working together, is that possible? But before that, there is the uh, case study of an orthodox, the Netflix Unorthodox with Wendy Mitchell and um, a wonderful colleague, uh, Ken and Cam. And uh, the full video of today's talk will be available to watch on screendaily.com. Please join us for the next one. Thank you very much, everybody, wherever you are. Uh, take care and, and see you all next time. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.